MA370 is an aviation mystery unlike any other. It's not just that 239 people disappeared into the night 10 years ago. It's that the evidence itself is so deeply weird. We're explaining these five greatest mysteries to introduce you to a podcast that is unlike anything you've seen or heard before. There's a lot of MA370 shows and podcasts out there, but what we're trying to do is something really radically different. We want to break it down into detailed examinations of all the evidence and try to build that together into a really rock solid foundation so we can understand with total clarity what happened to this plane. We're not here to sell you on a cockamamie theory. We're here to deliver the facts in a way that people can understand and absorb easily. We're going to take you carefully, meticulously, step by step through every twist and turn in the case, carefully considering every legitimate piece of information. MH370 is a technically complicated case with tons of scientific data. And the closer you look, the stranger it gets. Time and time again, reasonable assumptions that any normal person would make turn out to be wrong. But once you roll up your sleeves and dive into the details, a lot of this confusion goes away. It turns out that the range of possible fates is much more limited than most people can imagine. My name is Jeff Wise. I'm an aviation journalist and the author of the book, The Taking of MH370. You might also have seen me on the Netflix documentary, MH370, The Plane That Disappeared. I've been studying this case in detail for a decade, and I've talked to dozens of experts across a wide range of scientific fields. And my name is Andy Tarnoff. I'm the publisher and founder of On Milwaukee, a media company based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for the last 25 years. As a digital storyteller, I have been fascinated by aviation's greatest puzzle, and this is an amazing opportunity to take a serious and deep dive into solving it. One of the things that's different about our approach is that most other people inevitably try to tell a single story about what they think happened to the plane. And in doing that, they inevitably paper over the aspects of the story that theories really struggle to explain. The fact is that MH370 isn't as simple as a plane that simply vanished into the night. It's a disappearance that unfolded over the course of seven hours. And in that time, a whole bunch of strange things happened. And strange things kept happening in the months and the years that followed. MH370 isn't just aviation's greatest mystery, although it is. But it's also a collection of smaller mysteries. Here are five of the most mind-blowing mysteries of MH370. Question one, who made the plane go dark 40 minutes into the flight, and why? Yeah, this is the, the, the opening mystery of this whole event. It's a normal flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing, 40 minutes in, for reasons to, the, to this day no one can explain. The plane goes electronically dark, and it throws an aggressive U-turn and heads back over the Malayan Peninsula. We just don't know why somebody would have done this. And it's not one of those things that you could do with an autopilot. This is pilot control. We know it was pilot controlled because it was so aggressive that it's too aggressive for the autopilot to carry out by itself. Somebody commanded this turn. No motive makes any sense. And it's not really clear why anybody would want to do this. Question number two, why did the SATCOP system turn back on an hour after it went dark? This, for me, is the crux of the whole mystery. It's not where the mystery started, but it's the part of it that we have the hardest time grappling with. This is actually the, the key to everything that happens over the next six hours, where we know the plane was flying, we have this Inmarsat data, but we are so puzzled by it. Now, the plane was completely dark. It had turned around. It was seen on Malaysian military radar, but then three minutes after it leaves Malaysian military radar, at a point where it was completely invisible to the world, it could have gone anywhere, done anything, they were scot-free. And yet, the satellite system gets turned back on and it produces the signals that will let investigators figure out where to look for it. The thing that is really puzzling about this is there's two parts really. One is it's something that most airline captains don't know how to do. You can look it up, you can figure out by reading the manual how to do this thing, but it's not something the average airline captain knows about because I've talked to many of them. So how, do they, how did whoever did this know how to do it? And then secondly, why? What would be the motive for turning the SATCOM system back on? It would let you use the, the phone, for instance, the satellite phone, but that satellite phone wasn't used. And so it's really baffling both how whoever took this plane knew how to do it 
and why they would do it. Till that SATCOM system turned back on, it was easy enough to say this was a catastrophic accident or that the pilot made some emergency maneuver and all those systems were turned off. The thing is turning it back on signaled intent. It signals intent and sophistication. So it really changes the tenor of the whole conversation. And yet, it's something that many people who have commented on this mystery have completely overlooked. I think this really needs to be core because everything that happens follows from this mysterious act. So this is really, when I say that, that the MH370 mystery has itself mysteries embedded with it, this is the one that I think is the most baffling and the most important. Question number three, why wasn't the plane found on the southern seabed? After scientists at Inmarsat realized that they had this data, or more technically correct to say the metadata, the data about the information being exchanged between the plane and the satellite, they were able to put their heads together and after a lot of work come up with a rather sophisticated new kind of mathematics that allowed them to derive quite narrowly where on the seabed they should find the wreckage of this plane. Where was the plane located when it sent its final transmissions? And yet, after spending multiple years searching the seabed and covering an area the size of Great Britain, nothing was found on the seabed. Nothing was there. Why wasn't it there? You might be tempted to say, well, the ocean is big, you know, it's hard to find things. But they had been able to define quite precisely where to look, and yet it wasn't there. Why wasn't it there? How come this puzzling circumstance arose, and how do we explain it? Most people who look at this from a sort of mainstream perspective just find it easy to completely overlook. They, they, they act as if it's not a huge problem. In the course of this podcast, we explain why it really is a big problem and how we can grapple with it. It is a huge problem. Planes don't disappear, and eventually they get found. Never before has so much effort been put into finding a missing plane and, and hundreds of millions of dollars without result. Question number four. When scientists looked at all the marine sea life on the debris, it looked way too young. Why? For a year and a half after MH370 disappeared, a lot of people were wondering, well, how come there isn't any floating debris? Nothing's been spotted from the air. Nothing has been found washed up on beaches. Where did the wreckage go? Where did the floating debris go? Well, finally, after a year and a half... The first piece was found washed up on the French island of La Réunion in the western part of the Indian Ocean. And for many people, that was case closed. Okay, now we know that the plane went into the ocean because we have a piece of wreckage that obviously floated from the impact site. Well, hang on. If you look closer at the evidence, it again turns puzzling because this piece was completely covered in a kind of barnacle called Lepus anatifera, a goose barnacle. And scientists can determine the temperature that the water of the water it was uh, floating through and how old the barnacles are by analyzing their shells. And when they did that, they found out that the, it looked like these barnacles were only a couple of months old, not a year and a half. So how do you explain that discrepancy? Why is the sea life growing on these pieces of debris so much younger than you would expect given how long it's supposedly in the water? Question number five, how was one guy able to find all this debris? This is a really controversial question. As time went by, more and more pieces of debris were found washed up in various places, all of them in the western part of the Indian Ocean, which itself had implications about where the plane might have impacted if this debris did in fact come from a crash site. Here's a part that some people have raised questions about. Most of the pieces, there were about three dozen pieces that were eventually collected, some of them, not all of them, were definitively shown to be from MH370. But most of the pieces that were collected were collected by a single individual. Now, probabilistically, given how huge the ocean is, how much coastline there is, how many people were looking, you would expect that not to be the case. That basically, the chances of any given person finding any piece of debris is very, very low. But one guy seems to have defied the odds. Was he just very lucky or did he have a secret that nobody else knew about? That's something we're going to look at in a future episode. All of these individual mysteries roll up into the bigger mystery, which is what happened to this plane? What happened to the people? How do we solve this mystery? Can we solve this mystery? Does somebody know the answer? And how do we get people to pay attention? All of these mysteries themselves demand explanation. And the only way to do that is by building brick upon brick of fact and really rock solid inference. And all of this is available via our new podcast, 
Deep Dive MH370. It's available on every streaming platform. On video, it's on YouTube and Facebook. In audio, it's on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Amazon Music. It's everywhere that you could possibly view or listen to a podcast. We want you to come along with us on this journey. So strap in. This is really a crazy ride. We're going to take you on a roller coaster through aviation's wildest mystery.